Isaiah chapter 40 is one of the great passages of Scripture. It begins with these words, Comfort, oh comfort my people, says the Lord. Those words are well known to us, not only from Scripture, but also from their use in Handel's Messiah. In fact, Handel uses several phrases from this passage in writing music about God's promised Savior. But today we jump to the end of the passage, whereas, I, whereas Allison, who read a few moments ago in, in, in Isaiah chapter 40, even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah is writing to the Hebrew exiles in Babylon. They, they have been there for a couple generations. Back home in Jerusalem, the temple has been demolished. Their houses lay in ruins. The people are depressed and apathetic. Optimism was in short supply. God was preparing a highway in the desert in order to bring people home. But they doubted they would even have the strength to make the journey. Even young people, who should be eager for such an adventure, were disheartened. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. It is a sad picture indeed, a picture of an exhausted and weary people. But we don't have to go very far to get a picture of an exhausted and weary people today, do we? Just look around. Isn't that how many of us feel today? Many of us are weary travelers. Weary saints on the journey through this life. I might have been surprised in April at how weary I felt, but that doesn't faze me now. Nothing surprises me on how the ways in which the mundane exhaust us and the routine is far from normal. Others say they feel the same way. And the weariness we feel is not only a physical weariness, it is spiritual and mental weariness. Signs of light and hope are sometimes hard to discern. One day, things seem like they're looking up. The next day is full of gloom and doom. We feel like we've lost control, and in many ways, maybe we have. We feel displaced, almost like exiles in a strange land. I want to share with you part of an essay written for Time magazine by a writer named Bridget Schulte. This is how she begins. One evening, when my kids were young, I was outside weeding my infernal gravel yard that, if left unattended, begins to look like a furry chia pet. They were bouncing with sheer delight on the trampoline. Mommy, come jump with us, they cried. In a minute, I kept saying, just let me finish weeding. It was a time in my life when I used to routinely ask myself, what do I need to do so that I can feel okay? And then I'd run through the very, the never ending mental list. That evening with a familiar sense of vague panic rising, I felt compelled to finish at least one thing, the weeding on that long, long list. Lost in my churning thoughts, I didn't notice the sun go down or hear my kids go inside. When I looked up again, the sky was dark, the yard still covered in weeds, and I was alone. Schulte continues, this is how it felt to live my life most days, scattered, fragmented, exhausted. I was always doing more than one thing at a time, and I, I felt I never did any one particularly well. And I was always behind and always late, with one more thing or one more thing and one more thing to do before rushing out the door. Entire hours evaporated while I did that stuff that needed to get done. Entire, those entire hours evaporated. But once, once I'd done it, I couldn't tell you what it was that I'd done or why it seemed so important. 
I felt like the Red Queen of Through the Looking Glass, on speed, running as fast as I could, usually on fumes of four or five hours of sleep, and getting nowhere. Like the dream I kept having about trying to run a race wearing ski boots. Does any of her story sound familiar? Don't you, uh, you don't have to be a working mother to have this experience. I know plenty of others who are overwhelmed by the way they feel of all they need to do. I know plenty of retired folks whose to-do list is long and unrealistic. I think that's true in pre-pandemic and also current pandemic times. And that's why I love Schulte's question. What do I need to do before I can feel okay? How do you answer that question? Seriously, how do you answer that question? What do you need to do before you can feel okay? Well, maybe you answer the question, there's nothing I need to do to feel okay. I always feel okay because I know my self-worth rests in God's love for me. If that is your answer, bully for you. And please feel free to tune out for the next few minutes because this sermon is then going to be addressed to those of us who have a more nuanced response to that question. The times and the situations that we find ourselves in are extraordinary. We have at one time or another felt the burden of physical, emotional, and mental fatigue, sometimes all at once. It's not only our bodies, but also our minds and our spirits that are overloaded. Like the ancient Hebrew, Hebrews in exile, we have become weary and exhausted. And we can hear the words from Isaiah, both as an invitation and as a promise. We act on the invitation. As we act on the invitation, we receive what God promises. First, the invitation. They who wait upon the Lord. Now, the invitation to wait is not necessarily welcome these days. Our patience is running low. Yes, we are doing what we can to stay safe and looking out for ourselves and one another, and all of that is good. But mainly we are waiting rather impatiently until these dark days have passed and we can get back to some degree of, dare I call it, normal life. And yet there is great value in waiting upon God. And so we're invited to wait upon the Lord. And that means spending time in God's presence, soaking God's presence in and being in God's word, just like we're doing now in worship. When life is smooth and kind, we tend to be very self-sufficient, depending on ourselves and our own resources. But these times remind us of our dependence on God and our interdependence upon one another. In our weariness and exhaustion, we learn that our own human resources are not sufficient. That we really need God and each other. So we can use these days to wait upon God even more than usual, seeking God's truth in the word and God's presence in prayer and worship. We are invited to wait upon God with a sense of dependence. And it is an invitation also given by Jesus himself. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus teaches that, God, it, that the God on whom we wait has drawn very close to us. The everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, is the one who knows and loves and cares for each one of us. God does not faint or grow weary. So the psalmist says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and God will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. While the first piece is the invitation to wait on the Lord, the second comes as the promise for those who wait upon the Lord. The Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
the God, and God fulfilled that promise for those in exile, sustaining and strengthening them to walk along the wilderness path back home again, and strengthening them yet again for the rebuilding of their nation and the temple. Back to Schulte's essay. To, keep, to help her deal with her constant sense of being overwhelmed, she seeks out a productivity expert. An expert approaches, an expert's approach to time management is pretty simple. You can't manage time. Time never changes. There will always be 168 hours in the week. What you can manage are the activities you choose to do in that time and what busy and overwhelmed people need to realize, the expert says, is that you will never be able to do everything you think you need to do, want to do, or should do. The expert says, when we die, the email inbox will still be full. The to-do list will still be there, but you won't, she told us. 80% of the email that comes in to your inbox is crap anyway. And it takes you the equivalent of 19 and a half weeks a year just to sort through it. What? 80% of your to-do list is crap. Look, the stuff of life never ends. That is life. You will never clear your plate so that you can finally allow yourself to get to the good stuff. So you have to decide. What do you want to accomplish in this life? What's important to you right now? Well, that's the key, isn't it? When we answer the question, what do I need to do to feel okay? The answer should include those things that are important to us, the things that really matter. It shouldn't just list things like weeding, end quote. For help with all of this, let's turn to Jesus. What does Jesus need to do before he can be okay? Well, the passage from Mark this morning helps us answer that question. Those, in a few verses, we learn about how Jesus spends his days, how he allocates his 168 hours per week. Well, during the week, Jesus spends time with his disciples, heals people, and helps them return to their lives shares the good news and tells them about God, tells them about God's love for them, tells them about God's desire for them to have an abundant life. Jesus spends time alone in prayer. Prayer is the word that is used. Jesus attends to his own spirit and connects with God. Well, geez, I mean, that's a pretty good list. So what do you need to do? What do we need to do before we're okay? spend time with the people who matter to us, being a part of something bigger than ourselves, contribute to the healing of the world in some tangible way, make the world a better place, make the world a more whole place, nourish our own spirits, connect with God. On my best days, my answer includes some of those things that I just mentioned. You know what? I would like to have more best days for sure. Friends, God is strengthening us. So to see beyond the current struggles and keep us looking for the longer view, remembering the great future that God has pre prepared and that God has promised for God's people and all of creation. Lift up your eyes, Isaiah says, and see. God is at work and God is not finished yet. God is also renewing our strength so that we can run and walk with perseverance. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Along with patience, persistence is much needed these days. As the scripture tells us, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And God is giving us the strength to do the very thing as we wait. These are certainly difficult days, and there is no shame in being weary and feeling exhausted. But God's invitation and God's promise is sure. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
and it is by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit that just in a few minutes, we will step toward this communion table to remind ourselves of that, to be nourished, to be fed, and to be renewed. For all you weary saints, come and be fed. Be renewed by the presence of God in our lives from long ago and for all the days to come. Thanks be to God.